everyone, welcome to a new episode of the Computomics podcast. We have a great guest today. He actually started his marketing career at a multinational beverage company before he joined a San Francisco-based startup accelerator to lead their marketing and business development efforts. He's also, excitingly, the founder and CEO of Forward Fooding. And uh, the description that we read is, uh, it's the world's first collaborative platform for the food and beverage industry. Alessio Dantino, welcome to the Computomics podcast. Thank you very much, Anna, and thanks a lot for having me today. It's a true pleasure. Alessio, um, we, I mentioned it in the intro, um, you're the, the founder and CEO of Forward Fooding. Um, what's your company about? You're a startup aficionado, but uh, what's your pitch? What does Forward Fooding do? Okay, yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, uh, Forward <laughs> Fooding, a lot of people get it wrong uh, by, by, you know, um pronouncing it so you got it right which is already a great start <laughs> and uh, in a nutshell what forward fooding does is the world's first collaborative platform for the food and beverage industry which basically means that we foster food innovation um to redesign our food system by enabling collaborations among all the ecosystem players of the agri-food tech space so we've been uh, in operation for about five years now and I was lucky enough, you know, uh, after my corporate thing to, to basically uh, go to San Francisco to work for a sort of accelerator. Uh, and that's really when in 2013, I started dipping my toes into uh, the food tech space. And I got really fascinated about all the innovations that, you know, uh, some crazy folks, I guess, you know, and uh, <laughs> in the Bay Area, you know, we're developing using AI and uh, all sort of other, you know, technologies to uh, reproduce, you know, for instance, uh, animal proteins or, um, you know, using AI to uh, create more efficiencies in the way uh, farmers actually, you know, run their, their businesses. Um, and that's really where I got fascinated and how then, you know, I developed for a footing with the idea of uh, connecting really first the investors with the entrepreneurs and secondly, then uh, after we pivoted a few times, you know, <laughs> before identifying a model that actually worked, um, mostly corporate executives and investors with uh, actually the entrepreneurial community. When you say uh, you took a few turns until you found a model that worked, uh, what, what does that mean exactly? What, how do you bring those, those innovators together with investors and, and other players in the, in the industry? Yeah, so well, as any, I guess, uh, uh, company that was trying to innovate, right? <laughs> Back in 2013, I founded my first company, which was actually an investment platform that was connecting uh, solely, you know, investors and entrepreneurs in the food and food tech space. Um, and, you know, I guess in 2013, the ecosystem wasn't, you know, well, was, was really small, uh, to be fair with you. And uh, there was a need for connecting, you know, entrepreneurs with investors, but there was, it was very niche right? And so I guess it was probably too early, you know, to verticalize to begin with, um, to create basically an investment platform specifically, you know, for this space. Uh, and secondly, I guess when I tried to move it from San Francisco to London, which was actually back in 2015, um, that's when, that's where I, you know, I encounter in uh, a very different, basically, level of sophistication when it came to investor. Uh, there were some folks in the Bay Area that were doing it you know, professionally in, in London. Equity crowdfunding was actually more developed. So, you know, investing any sort of amount into a company in exchange of uh, equity. And uh, the level of sophistication, you know, there of, of the investors was very uh, different compared to the Bay Area. So those two, I think, elements, you know, combined made us then, you know, realize that first off, the unit economics of that company would have, would have never, you know, worked out as the number didn't add up. Um, but most and foremost, we couldn't create really a lot of impact as we did a couple of, you know, uh, successful fundraises, but we figured after that, that, you know, we were basically just helping companies to get more oxygen to get to the next funding round. And uh, when we stopped and think, you know, about how we could actually uh, improve the model and most and foremost, you know, the unit economics, um, we actually felt that, you know, by bringing some of these innovations to corporates, we could have actually created a way bigger impact at the system level, right? As, uh, as some of these new technologies get adopted by large players of the industry, you know, that could have actually a way bigger effect on the food system as a whole. And as we dig deeper into, you know, the issues that were affecting our food system, we really found our why, if you will. And um, that's where 
we really felt that you know hyper connecting all these players uh, in the ecosystem was really the 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 enabler of of some of these you know innovations or you know the adoption of these innovations as first and foremost i guess you know people need to know that these opportunities exist right and that's where that's where really the foundation of forward fluting as a company where we had this really epiphany of you know how can we contribute positively to transition from a system that is actually very broken to a system that actually has new te- leverages new technologies that makes it more efficient and sustainable um, and that's really where we decided to cater uh, the services to our uh, corporate and investor clients and beyond but really to um, kind of again connect the parties that need to work together to really have that impact at the systemic level can you give an example of of maybe if if you are allowed to i assume you of are course. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely so over the years we've worked with a number of fortune 500 companies in the food and beverage space to help them you know with their tax counting efforts um and off the back of uh, some of these counting activities we have actually have created in- engagement programs between the likes of Nestle, for instance, the M&A team with the selected companies in London, uh, with the likes of General Mills, uh, um, where again, they help, they ask us to help them figure out what their next you know, innovation strategy as far as open innovation you know, was going to look like. And then uh, and they've asked us to shortlist globally uh, companies that were uh, working in specific verticals within the agri food tech space. Um, but then on the startup side, we basically help them uh, uh, to get visibility as well, right? So we don't only do it um, bottom, well, top down, as you know, we get a brief from a corporate or from an investor, and then we go and look for uh, companies that they could, well, they would fit the fit their bill. Um, but also we do we do it bottom up, right? By creating a, a visibility for some of these companies, primarily through two uh, main activities the first one is called the food tech 500 which uh, is a global listing that we run every year that um creates basically the 500 well showcases 500 companies that we think you know are going to be becoming you know fortune 500 of agri food tech um and this is across the whole supply chain so anything from ag tech all the way through next generation food and drinks food waste tech uh, and even beyond um and on the other hand, uh, we, through our food tech innovation hubs in London, Barcelona, and Milan, we have resident companies that we help to basically uh, connect with some of our uh, network uh, and uh, some, of the, some of the players of our network. And there we do basically two different main activities. On the one end, we provide an equity-free and uh, fee-free actually program for selected companies uh, where we work with the founders on specific challenges that they're that they are currently working on um and on the other hand we have a greater community of uh, companies that gravitates around our spaces and those are the ones that then you know we will try to connect with our uh, corporate investor clients uh, but most and foremost really we help them to become ready to then enter our spaces as resident companies okay that, that was a lot of info. Maybe let's let's break it <laughs> break it apart and go a little deeper. Uh, one thing I'm actually quite interested in is the the food tech 500 list that you that you just mentioned as one of the the two primary ways you create visibility for for companies. Um, you I think you already described it quite well, but um, if if we think about methodology, how you know how if I'm now a company that wants to get on your on your food tech 500 list, how do I get there? What's your methodology in in ranking these companies? What do you mm-hmm. go by? Of course. So that's a great question, Anna, and uh, is a, is one that we get quite a lot. So <laughs> I would assume so. Everyone wants uh, to get on the list, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you the full rundown of how of actually how we e got created as a project, because uh, I think that would help you to wrap your head around, you know, how, how do we go about ranking the businesses, but also most and foremost, uh, um, what really led us, you know, to create such a such a listing um, back in two thousand nine. 19, actually, a company called Beyond Meat went public. And uh, in our headquarters in London, we were all debating, you know, who's going to be next, right? And uh, we did have at that point uh, uh, sort of like the, um, the the backbone of our uh, data intelligence platform, which is called the Foodtech uh, Data Navigator, which is a, a data intelligence platform that monitors about 17,000 
uh, ecosystem actors right now. But at that point, you know, we didn't have really, uh, we, had, we had quite a lot of data, but, you know, didn't, didn't have a, a, a structure methodology to rank, you know, these businesses to get to a point where, you know, we could have spotted who was going to be, you know, the next company was going to IPO. Um, and so we said, you know, why don't we actually ask companies to apply and then we build a methodology that would allow us to really um, uh, rank them. And, uh, and then, you know, this should give a prediction of uh, uh, how likely they are to grow fast or at least, you know, to get to a point where they get on a trajectory to either IPO or, you know, um, go and, you know, become their very big companies like, you know, Fortune 500 ones. Um, and so that's, that's how we really did it. Uh, and uh, we started, you know, with an idea, we set it up, we were like, okay, the methodology is going to be around three main criteria, which we felt, you know, were um, significant of the growth or on the one end and on the sustainability practices on the other. Um, and so the methodology is really split it into three main pillars. The first one is called the business size score. The second one is called the digital footprint score. And these two uh, variables are basically taken from our own uh, intelligence platform. So they are algorithm led and they are respectively a proxy of the size of the business in terms of headcounts and number of offices where the company operates from. Um, uh, while the digital footprint is actually a proxy of how fast they're growing over social media as a, as a company, but also most and foremost, uh, uh, how much traffic they're actually able to generate on their website. So we take external data sources that actually feed our intelligence platform and through an algorithm we basically ensure well we create these basically scores right um but we felt that there wasn't enough to really also capture one element which we think is really important about food tech which is which is actually sustainability and um, and so there we basically have built in in absence of a of a framework that was basically well, I guess suitable and could cater for the whole spectrum of companies that we were uh, evaluating, which as I said, you know, it's companies that use technology to create more efficiency or sustainability across the supply chain. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually built it from scratch. And so we in partnership actually with the sustainability experts from the academia world, uh, in particular from the University of Turin, um, we basically build a self-assessment based on the SDGs that allows companies to uh, pick basically the SDG that they think they're contributing to, and then deep dive into each of them. We ask just for the top three in the, in the, in the assessment um, to basically understand how they're contributing to them. And those inputs basically then generate the sustainability score. Uh, and what, what, in or what shape does that input take? Do they describe or so basically the, the way I imagine it from your description is um, they have maybe all the SDG goals um, uh, there to select from. They select three and then they get a chance to describe in what way they are hitting goal number six, number 14 and number 19. So let's say. Correct. But this is done in a very structured way, as in uh, they select the top three and then based on this on the SDG that they have uh, selected they get additional questions related to that specific SDG, which then allows us to turn it into quantitative uh, figures um, based on their response. And so imagine that you know, you're contributing to zero hunger, for instance, as an SDG, then we will ask you how exactly are you contributing and to basically self-assess yourself on specific sub-questions for each single SDG based on the answers we get, then we generate better the sustainability score. And uh, how, like, if, if one gets on the food tech 500 list, what can you expect? What kind of visibility? Because it, you said it's one of the two main avenues to create visibility for those, those companies. How, what comes with a placement or especially a high ranking in the, in the list? Yeah. So it's a great question again. Anna. And uh, it's, uh, it's one that uh, we always, uh, we obsessively try, you know, to measure the type of exposure that we're capable of creating for some of these companies. Because, as I mentioned earlier, um, the idea behind the Fruitech 500 was really to create a, an effective tool to provide as much visibility as possible to a, a set of companies, you know, beyond our capabilities of, you know, creating exposure for the ones that we currently work, you know, more closely with within our 
food tech innovation hubs across Europe. Um, and the idea there was really to first and foremost, you know, raise awareness about some of these technologies, which, and when we started, you know, in 2019, um, I can guarantee you that a lot of people, you know, didn't even know, uh, you know, 20 proteins, I guess, you know, <laughs> was, or, or microbiome, or, you know, there were terms, technical terms that, you know, were not that easy, I think, you know, for people to rub their head around. Um, but to give you some figures, basically over the last three years, um, we have received about for 5,000, 5,500 applications from international uh, food tech uh, startup and scale-up companies. We were able to basically include only 500 each year uh, as we are now at the third edition. And we have reached about 180 countries in terms of uh, audience uh, that basically saw the list. So users that went and downloaded the list from our website. Um, we have onboarded about 40 international media partners that have helped us to basically um, convey the, the listing in their own actually um, countries uh, of origin. Um, we have about 300, 350 million monthly readership of aggregated media coverage, as again, the, the listing basically was then picked up by um, specialized uh, publications. Uh, and we have about 2.5 million social media impressions uh, that were generated uh, by the listing. So this was really the, I think in our view, again, as a relatively small company, you know, uh, was a powerful tool to really give a visible, to raise awareness about the technologies, to really showcase the underdogs, right? Not the ones that, you know, get basically covered all over the media. Uh, and to basically with one tool, you know, give as much exposure as possible to the innovators that we think, you know, are really contributing to create a better uh, food system. That's, that's amazing. I mean, those are quite impressive numbers. And uh, as you were saying, uh, the, the listeners don't know, you gave us kind of a mini tour of the offices <laughs> um, before, we, before we actually started uh, taping. And I mean, they are nice, but as you said, it's not a huge, it doesn't seem to be that huge of a company. How many people do you have in your team? So it's about 12 of us now, and uh, I've scattered across three offices, uh, but we're growing really fast. So I, we think that by the end of the year, we could get to 20. Oh, wow. That's <laughs> almost doubling within within the year. That's that's uh, is basically yeah. kind of following what we've been doing over the past uh, three years, really. Exciting times. Well, um, you know, speaking of, of developments, you referenced it a little bit already in, in some of your answers, but um, with the work you do, you know, selecting, trying to to find innovators, trying to find um, maybe also technology that that has a lot of potential to to impact the yeah our our supply chain or the food tech industry. What would you say are um, trends that you can identify that that you feel you know will strongly impact the the field? Really good question. Well, um, I guess we could talk for hours about <laughs> <laughs> trends and. Uh, and micro trends that we see within, you know, uh, larger, I guess, verticals. But I guess the most obvious ones are, you know, tuna protein is definitely one that I think is gonna is there to stay. I mean, the the current resources we have available on this planet um, will not be sufficient really to keep doing or keep, you know, creating just the animal based proteins or or plant based proteins, you know, per se. So. The biggest trend that I actually see there is uh, hybridations of actually technologies uh, as far as alternative proteins are concerned. If we put, you know, within alternative proteins, things like, you know, plant-based proteins, but also cell-based. Um, so uh, let's say lab grown meat or, you know, cells basically that get reproduced to create uh, animal-based proteins uh, or even precision fermentation, which is the um, sort of science behind uh, leveraging bacteria to create actually proteins. Um, I see that these three main, uh, um, let's call them, you know, uh, pillars within the alternative protein uh, space will start to hybridate and we started seeing, you know, uh, a few companies already developing, you know, hybrid products um, to basically cater for uh, the masses, right? As uh, some of these technology per se have well, it's shown, you know, um, limitations in terms of their ability to really um, create these proteins at 
at a very large scale, right? In the case of plant-based is uh, the plants itself, right? Whether it's soy, whether it's uh, green peas, basically you still require quite a lot of, uh, you know, resources to uh, grow the plants in the first place. And then there was a whole process of extrapolating, you know, the uh, protein from it. Um, in case of cell-based, the medium that they actually get used to replicate the cells uh, to turn them into you know, a piece of meat or a piece of fish um, is actually very um, time consuming, but also mostly for most is very expensive. Um, and so again, that's kind of the bottleneck of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the technology. And in terms of precision fermentation as well, um, when it comes to large scale, besides liquid fermentation, um, the other type of biomass fermentations, again, also have some... Uh, challenges when it comes to, to scale. So I think the abbreviations of, of this technology could really bring, however, this, the, these companies to leapfrog, you know, their ability to scale, um, produce at scale, you know, through different type of technologies. And, uh, and that's where we see that there is a lot of uh, activities now, you know, happening in terms of also investment, but most and foremost in terms of tech development, really. I'll give you another example of that. You know, 3D printing started as a technology that was key, it was very niche. The 3D printing for food, of course, you know, um, was very niche. And then it started developing to a point where now you can produce with a with a 3D printer about you can print basically out about 500 kilograms of uh, cell um, plant-based meat uh, every hour. So uh, again, the, we started as like, you know, one printer that was taking probably, you know, 20 to 30 minutes to print a little steak. And it got now to a point where they can print out, you know, 500 kilos an hour. So um, again, when you hybridate, I think all these type of technologies together, um, this is where things get exciting, get exciting as you're probably capable of really competing also from a price standpoint with you know traditional um, farming or you know more traditional let's say industries and what, what would you say is are there any i mean 3d printing feels almost like an old technology at this point it's crazy <laughs> it's not old but it's been around for a little bit um i guess the same is true of, of artificial intelligence but um you mentioned it before that that seems to be one of the the big uh areas of technology where there's a lot of movement happening or how, how would you say how would you yeah that absolutely trend? i mean uh, it, again it depends on what is applied right uh, there are companies uh, as i mentioned earlier you know when i started my career in this space uh, about almost a decade ago um there were companies that were already using you know artificial intelligence to replicate basically the composition of uh, animal-based proteins using plants right and so what they were doing with artificial intelligence was really creating all these different you know combinations um to really identify you know what were the plants that needed to be used to repre recreate you know the same texture the same look and feel and the same taste of let's say you know um, a piece of meat or a piece of fish right um and so that type of science has already been, I think, proven to be um, useful for this type of uh, exercises, if you will. So can you give uh, an example of maybe one company that uh, that is using AI in, in, in an innovative way from your of from course, your database? Anna. Yes, of course, Anna. Let me just uh, actually dig deeper into our platform to give you more data points. As I always like to to give <laughs> to back my my statement with data. Um, so if I put AI and machine learning into our data intelligence platform, I get about a 400 actually uh, companies working in this space. And what I mean by that is um, effectively using AI and machine learning as uh, uh, one component of the solution that they have actually uh, developed, the tech solution that they have developed. Um, and I get, you know, companies ranging from, um, you know, companies operating, for instance, in the vertical farming space, like let's say bovary farming, that uses actually AI to understand uh, what are the best uh, plants that, um, that that can be can be actually grown, you know, vertically, uh, depending on the yields that they actually generate, and they use AI to create predictive models 
uh, of how these plants you know could actually um, develop in different setting settings um or companies you know like uh, um imaging dairy um, that is creating animal free dairy proteins uh, um for using again ai so the whole combination of uh, uh the protein the milk protein but again using uh, alternative ingredients and they use basically ai to identify what were the experiments that they were needed to uh to be developed to get to the, the exact result of you know um reproducing the milk in this case um or companies like uh Moa Food Tech, which actually upcycles um, in, um, byproducts from uh, the production line to create, uh, thanks to biotechnology, to, to, transform them, to transform them actually into a new source of protein. And again, they use AI to basically do all those experiments, you know, that they would do in a, in a lab, but kind of simulating them, you know, digitally and using AI to understand what are the results that they're going to get. Right, which is much faster and obviously saves on, on resources. I mean, computomics is that area as well, although maybe more targeted towards towards the, the plant breeding side. Um, but we've had very interesting interviews in previous episodes. Hint to the listeners, if you haven't already, check them out. <laughs> um, but it's, it's really exciting to see all the different kinds and, and with the examples you just gave as well, like the, the, the breadth of, of area where um, AI can be employed to, yeah, to, to create innovation, to make things faster, better, um, and create impact into the, to the whole field. Absolutely. And again, this is where we focus a lot of our efforts and really understanding also how these technologies could evolve, you know, over in the foreseeable future to really become sort of like the new industry standards, right? When it comes to doing specific, you know, activities or tasks, right? And in this case, you know, again, AI, I think, uh, provides the benefit of, uh, as you you know mentioned earlier, of uh, basically simulating a lot of these experiments that you would do in the lab. So you know anything that has to do really with biotechnology, um, at a fraction of the cost, and you know a lot more efficiently and effectively than if you were to actually do them, you know, in the lab. So I think this is where really AI can have a, a big impact in, uh, um supporting decision making you know at the company level and really understanding also where where to go next if you know what i mean i mean you know science and i guess any breakthrough uh, innovation have been underpinned by you know millions of experiments so if you can really uh, streamline that process or even make you know more efficient in terms of you know the resources that are needed time and uh, and investment really um, to do so, I think, you know, that could really um, create very, you know, tangible benefits for companies in really understanding also what are the, the next technologies they should be investing in. What are they? <laughs> I mean, AI, <laughs> I, we mentioned AI kind of broadly, but what, what would, would you say, what are the, the game changers that, that you see if, you know, if you have a sense? Yes. Yeah, so that's a million dollar uh, question, I guess. <laughs> At Forward Footing, we're actually a very big fan of uh, what we call the enabling technologies. So things like, um, you know, uh, DNA or genetics, you know, uh, analysis for plants when for vertical farming is one. So companies are really developing solutions um, to enable um, vertical farmers to then, you know, be better positioned to actually decide which crops, for instance, you know, they want to uh, grow uh, within their farms, again, using genetics or DNA analysis, um, or uh, companies working in the nano encapsulation, for instance, space, in, as far as proteins are concerned, which basically allows uh, product development companies to capture uh, things like probiotics into a protein, and therefore extending the shelf life of, uh, of, of probiotics. Um, are again other uh, enabling technology that we think could really leapfrog, you know, some of the existing uh, um, solutions that are in the market, uh, or even companies working, you know, in the microbiome space, which is actually a topic of interest and uh, a field where I see that 
where I think, you know, we're going to see a lot of uh, new breakthrough, you know, coming um, into the market as, you know, again, the technology becomes more mature, but also companies start developing, you know, complementary technology that can really help, for instance, you know, consumers to understand, you know, the composition or the microbiome or farmers to understand the, uh, what is the current status of their soil, right? And what are the bacteria that have been maybe degraded over time and they would need to be, you know, um, inputted into the soil again to restore it. Um, I think as this technology uh, evolves and, you know, becomes more mature, then, you know, this could really become, some of this technology could really become the new industry standard. And this is where I see things like, um, you know, microbiology or, you know, biotechnology for the soil, for instance, becoming an increasingly, you know, interesting field of study as basically we realize that to basically create good food, we need to do it in good soil, right? And so uh, if we don't go at the source, solving the issues at the source, you know, um, we would not basically be able to, to really get what we want out of the food system, right? And um, so, yeah, I guess these are some of the, and then there are many others, you know, when it comes to austerity protein, again, uh, precision fermentation, I think is a very interesting uh, space. And there are a lot of different, you know, nuances of the technology that can be explored there. Uh, and again, how you, you combine them, I think, is going to be the key to really be able to compete with even, you know, plant-based, uh, for instance, uh, uh, alternatives um but again yeah I, I mean the future is i guess it's really exciting but nobody ex knows how exactly are they going to be you know combined to really unlock basically this um this this next generation of uh, of solutions really for sure i mean that's that's what you always have especially in complex systems right to to you know there's so many places where you can kind of where you can concentrate on but you never know, or it's really hard to know beforehand what's going to be that that leapfrogging, you know, idea that 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 real true innovation. Uh, and then afterwards, like of course, <laughs> it had to be this way. We tend to do that, I guess, maybe also, um, you know, just in a in a storytelling manner. But um, I, I was also interested in in the question. I mean, you identified a few super exciting areas where where things are happening or that that show a lot of potential but what would you say are the challenges uh, to to realize a relevant innovation in in the field can you identify specific challenges especially looking at the the breadth i mean you see a lot of companies who try to do that a lot of startups young companies or or smaller companies what challenges do they face in creating this innovation well, that's a very difficult question. As, uh, I know. <laughs> it, is, it effectively depends very much on the type of companies we look at, right? If um, I'll give you an example. If you take ag tech, you know, usually the one of the biggest challenges is uh, really getting the farmers to adopt or even try and trial, you know, some of these technologies. The reason being that there might be, you know, more resistance um, in doing things in a different way than they've always been done, right? Uh, and also sometimes, you know, the tech literacy really is, um, is the biggest barrier, right? When uh, you go to someone who is used to, you know, uh, managing their, their land and, you know, doing a very sort of like, um, you know, manual work and you go there and talk about, you know, how AI can help them, you know, to run their business. So I think first you need to wrap your really your head around what it is, and it needs to be explained in a very you know simple terms, um, and then you know maybe you can really get the chance to even have that conversation, right? Where you can mm -hmm. show maybe that the farmer that really uh, through your sensor or through your you know drone or you know robot they can really benefit you know um, from from running their, their business in a different way. Uh, when it comes to alternative protein, that's a whole you know, different set of, I guess, challenges which are more related oftentimes, you know, to consumers' uh, preferences or consumers, you know, uh, behavior. Uh, but also, on the other hand, um, they are the challenges, I guess, for any company operating in that space is really getting that critical mass of what I was referring to earlier. Um, when it comes to really competing with traditional, you know, uh, source of proteins as, uh, 
again, we all know that um, animal-based uh, agriculture have benefited from, you know, very generous subsidies over a long time, uh, over a long period of time. And uh, again, competing from a price perspective, you know, with uh, how cheap basically some of these commodities, you know, are, is very difficult. And uh, again, as, as consumers change basically their behaviors, and again, I think the pandemic also has accelerated, you know, that transition. Um, on the one end, you know, they may want, they may look for, you know, more um, alternatives or some, some, some companies, you know, even call them successors as, you know, they don't have to be, you know, uh, necessarily alternatives, but they could really become um, the new, again, uh, you know, type of uh, meat that we could be eating or fish or, you know, whatever um, traditional products you can think of. Um, but again, there, when it comes to serving, for instance, you know, uh, international markets, that's where you really need to crack, you know, that model in ensuring that you have nailed, you know, uh, the production at scale and you can be, you know, price competitive in the long haul as also more and more consumers um, get basically, you know, get converted into flexitarians or, um, you know, they follow a more plum, plum forward, you know, diet. Um, and again, there, the challenge is, uh, is really knowing your numbers and, and really nailing that model that can allow you to squeeze out margins, again, like you do in, uh, in again, traditional, um, more traditional, you know, products, where those economies of scale really allow you to make your product as price competitive as possible with uh, the uh, traditional, you know, counterparts. Um, and last but not least, I would say is uh, distribution. As again, you need to make your products, you know, uh, known and available. Um, as consumers again also look for convenience, after all. And and there the challenge is that oftentimes you know you don't really um, control uh, your distribution channels, as, especially if you go on down the route of you know retailing your products into supermarkets and uh, kind of you need to depend on you know how the category also evolves within you know a supermarket and what are the basically what's the available space on the shelf you know for for you to play into actually that category and so mm -hmm. i think there would the one of the big well not the big mistake but one of the most common i would say mistake that we see companies you know in the food tech space making is that they want to build their category themselves right without realizing that they, they might not have you know the resources to really do it so Sometimes it's easier, you know, to play in an existing category with a better product, right? Than building the category from scratch and, you know, doing all the consumer education, all the uh, advocacy, all the, you know, um, all the fighting also to get, you know, on the mm -hmm. shelf. And uh, I think that's where some of, uh, a, a lot of actually, you know, exciting also innovation kind of get lost or, you know, don't don't unlock the full potential, but just because they play in a too small, you know, so to speak, you know, category. I think that's a great point. I've, I don't think I've ever thought about it that way. Um, but yeah, I, I think that makes sense. If you're you know, super passionate, you're you're you've created a startup, you have this great idea that sometimes maybe you get lost in in your USP and your unique selling point, and and you think you need to do all the work. Um, and and but don't have the resources to do them where it might be easier or the better strategy to think about okay what formats do we have like this like supermarket <laughs> what do they already have like where can we slot in rather than creating like building something from the ground up which you're already doing when you're creating a company but um, that's I think that's a that's a pretty <laughs> exactly pretty I mean yeah. to summarize it you know after all as a company as an early stage in a company that wants to kind of challenge the status quo and you know innovate somehow you need to basically be able to leverage uh, or piggyback you know on somebody else you know resources which are maybe you know other industry players that have created this category or they have you know uh, contributed to uh, develop it you know as a again as an entrepreneur i think you need to be capable of uh, um squeezing out sort of resources out of everything that is available out there and i think you know in the case of um 
emerging categories like you know in a way you know also plant-based uh, uh, meat and fish alternatives uh, or even you know egg replacements um you need to basically be able to piggyback on somebody else doing the education for instance on the consumer level for you to focus on you know nailing the product or nailing you know the distribution channel the route to market or you know whatever else is more strategic really to for you to focus on and and i think again there also uh but this is more generally um collaboration is really the way uh forward as uh, a lot of these companies are i guess in the startup space you know is is fairly well recognized and very well you know leveraged as a tool to um create bigger impact right okay. but i think in a corporate world you know it's still very far from becoming the the way they really develop their competitive advantage right and we see a lot of other clients you know really struggle with that to be to be honest with you um although you know they want and they are really eager you know to do it then there the difference in the big difference is that you know lie into the infrastructure of a startup or a corporate sometimes makes it you know very difficult to really either go you know to see the same spade or um really to get things moving you know within a large you know corporate setup um and i think that's where again our idea of fostering uh, these collaborations is really to create as many you know contacts as possible for them you know um you know opportunities to flourish right but um i think really almost embracing that it's better to go with someone that you know going alone in you know no matter whether you are you know early stage company or a very big corporate is really the way we can really fix i think our food system well that's i i feel like that's also a beautiful <laughs> summary to to our wide ranging conversation thank you so much alessio for for your time and and for sharing about the food tech list uh, i mean we we did cover a lot of ground uh, we learned about how you rank the the main scores business size digital footprint sustainability um, how you rank for the food tech 500 list and and what what are some of the exciting developments in the in the field as well as some some major challenges uh, alessio anyone who'd like to apply to uh, ford foodings food tech list or uh, you know just learn a little more about your programs how can they contact you how can they reach you or can they learn more It's super simple and on, on our website for refooding.com uh, you'll find all the information available uh, for the food tech 500 uh, but also for all the other activities that we run including our food tech innovation hubs so and then while for specifically the food tech 500 uh, on forfooding.com slash food tech 500 companies can already apply for the 2022 edition um, which is which we will then launch actually next year uh, in February Perfect. Thank you so much. And for our listeners out there, um, obviously, we will also link all the resources on our site, computomics.com. So feel free to check that out and hope to have you back next time for the Computomics podcast. Mm -hmm.